how do people vote? Is it a, an intellectual ec exercise only? Do people vote if they have a gut feeling? And why are commercials, why are political ads designed to appeal to your emotion? And that is because we are human beings. We have feelings and we, we intertwine those feelings with facts. Hi, and welcome. My name is Susan Spurlock. I'm the executive director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. Now in its 115th year, the forum continues to provide the people of Boston and around the globe the chance to hear and engage in dialogue with important voices and leaders on timely issues facing our citizenry. This afternoon, we continue Ford Hall Forum's storied legacy by welcoming back to the podium one of the most important voices, David Paleologos, director of the Suffolk University Political Research Center, and one of the nation's most respected and trusted pollsters, who will give a talk, The Road to 2024, America's Next Unprecedented Presidential Election. Each of the last presidential elections has been presented with its own unique challenges, from historically unpopular candidates to voting during a global pandemic. 2024 is shaping up to be no different. In his presentation, Dave will discuss the swing states, critical voting blocks, and crucial issues that could make or break the 2024 elections. Today's program is a collaboration among Suffolk University's Office of Advancement, Political Science and Legal Studies Department, and GBH Forum Network, and is a program of Suffolk Weekend. I'd like to acknowledge the Lowell Institute, whose generous funding makes programs like this possible. This afternoon, we are joined by LaToya Edwards, and it is my true pleasure to tell you a bit about her. LaToya is an Emmy award-winning anchor on NBC10 Boston and NECN. And she was recently named one of Boston Magazine's most influ influential Bostonians. She's a multi-talented journalist, moderating political debates, field anchoring live news events, securing exclusive one-on-one -on -one interviews and emceeing countless, and I do mean countless charity events each year. She is a daughter of Boston, born and bred here in Boston, and she will serve as this afternoon's moderator. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dave Peleologos. Dave, welcome back to the Forum Podium. It feels like this is probably your 100th time, but I know it's not that, but it's so great that you have joined us again. Take it away, Dave. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you to WGBH, NBC10, um, all of the members of the Ram family at Suffolk University. Enjoy the Parents Weekend. Uh, Susan uh, from uh, Ford Hall Forum. And also Latoya, um, I, I've just been a, an admirer of Latoya for many, many years, and, and her work is just outstanding. Um, so thank you. I also want to acknowledge President Kelly. Um, President Kelly has been an enormous supporter of the Research Center, enabling us to reach far and wide in, in national politics. Um, I'm going to open with um a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm going to start with an initiative really that President Kelly was uh, responsible for making happen. Um, <clears throat> we did um, we did a survey for the Sawyer Business School. Now you may say, what does that? What does a a survey about business issues and financial issues have to do with the presidential election? And you're going to see a few a few slides in that the finances, the issue of the economy is crucial to the 2024 election, an election which most pollsters are going to talk about how races split on gender or on political party affiliation or on race. 
But there is another demographic that I think we need to be aware of that is going to directly impact the 2024 race. So let's take a look. Um, so this was a survey that we did for the Sawyer Business School. Um, and it is an awesome opportunity for students in the Sawyer Business School to have the benefit of what we provide for political science students, which is the ability to contribute questions to a survey and have, if you, if those questions are selected by USA Today and, and, and us, you have the ability to have your names posted on a national poll in the statement of methodology. It's a huge opportunity for Suffolk University students to have a real booster to their CV so that when they're applying for jobs that they have a competitive edge over students from other universities. So let's get right into the first question. We opened this survey with an open-ended question. Next slide. The open-ended question was, what one word describes for you the state of the economy? Now, there's a reason we asked this question open-ended, and there's a reason we asked this question first. We don't want this question to follow other pre-coded questions, which may tailor how a respondent responds. So when you ask an open-ended question, they can say whatever they want. They determine the response categories, not us, not the pollster. And you can see what the responses were. You have three bars really talking about overall positive responses. People using the words excellent, good, a growing economy, improving economy, fair or average. But look at the red bars, which kind of total what we would call overall negative sentiment. People were using words like horrible, terrible, uh, disastrous, chaotic, uh, unstable, volatile, anxiety. And so when I thought about this slide, I was thinking, you know, I watch CNBC and I watch the business channels and Bloomberg News. And if you read Barron's or you read the Wall Street Journal, they paint a different picture of the economy. And it dawned on me that they're painting a picture based on government statistics that are older, that are a month old or a quarter old. I was listening to the voices of respondents who were expressing intense anxiety about the economy. And when you hear those voices, and you one has to believe that these are the statistics that are going to show up in a month or two, or in the next quarter when the presidential election begins. And that's why I think this poll got so much attention. I mean, this poll was everywhere, not only in USA Today, it was in the 100 daily newspapers that Gannett owns. It was in over a thousand weeklies, even the New York Times which is a direct competitor of the U of USA Today, they picked up this poll. And usually when you're a competitor, a print competitor, you never usually po post the poll results of that competitor. They did because they saw how important these survey results were. Next slide. So we also do a check and balance in a pre-coded way to figure out whether or not people are just talking stream of consciousness in an open-ended question, or whether it's backed up by valid other pre-coded questions. And here are two. Do you feel the economy is improving or getting worse? You can see the same seven and 10. We're saying it's getting worse. And would you say your cost of living is easing or rising? Again, cost of living rising, an important sentiment, which reinforces that open-ended question. Next slide. Spending habits. This this kind of gave me a chill, you know, um, of the following household budget categories. Where do you see your cost of living rising the most? So here you have, and again, this is a poll of a thousand adults in the country, uh, plus or minus three percent. So when you see numbers like this, they're very powerful, and this makes sense. So people's point of contact with inflation happens most regularly with food prices. Food prices are seen every, however often you grocery shop, might be every three days, every week, every two weeks. And so that stands to reason that food prices were cited as the most, uh, um, uh, where the most rise of inflation is, is being seen. You see housing costs and utility bills, 
they're also important, but they're more of a, on a, a monthly uh, interim. Um, and you see some of the other uh, high categories. On the right side of this chart, um, the first thing I thought about was, boy, I wouldn't want to be in retail. Look at this question. Thinking about holiday shopping, and again, this poll was taken in September and released on the 12th. Do you think this year you are, you are you will spend more, spend less, or spend about the same? You, this isn't a good sign if you're in the retail business because you've got 44% of respondents who are saying spend less. Only 14% were planning to spend more, and 40% said they'd spend about the same. That's going to have implications because when I see that right chart, I think, Think back to my economics 101 days, when you see less spending for consumption of goods and services, that means profits are going to go down, margins are going to decrease for businesses, businesses may eventually in November and December may have to lay off people, uh, or their access to capital is potentially going to be reduced, and then that's going to impact the stock market and, the, and, and those companies' stock prices, which potentially could happen in November and December. And so when you add it all up, it's it's a very a tough outlook based on what we're seeing now. Again, polls are a snapshot in time, but it's a tough outlook uh, for holiday uh, shopping. Next slide. Are you cutting back spending on, so so we, we gave respondents seven categories of items that people spend money on, and we basically asked, are you cutting back spending? So this was not good news for people eating out or buying clothes. So what this chart shows is that 71% of America is telling us now that they're eating out less, they're cutting back spending on that, on that item, and that they're cutting back spending on clothes. Uh, and then majorities are saying they're cutting back or postponing travel, cutting back or postponing home improvements, although it gets closer with groceries, utilities, and people aren't necessarily cutting back or, on driving or Ubering. That seems to be the thing people cling to. But it's important to, uh, to think about this because when you have the kind of dire situation that we showed in that first slide, you have to think about, well, who especially is being hurt? And as one would expect, next slide, people who earn less are going to be hurt the most. This is a slide I call it binary nomics. And in this slide, we looked at under $50,000 households responses of people cutting back versus over 100,000. And you can see the cutbacks are happening across the board in seven out of seven categories among people who are earning under 50,000. There might not be a lot of people watching this today who are in that, but they are an important, and this really comes back to full circle to politics, they are an important group of people and voters. Look at the cutback numbers. 78%, there's all the way across to 61%, seven out of seven being cut back, whereas over 100,000 households, sure, they're cutting back a little, they're telling us, on eating out and on clothes shopping, but not really when it comes to travel, home improvements, groceries, certainly not utilities, and certainly not driving less. So the economy is really hitting two different people, two different ways. Next slide. And so the result of this is that people are saving less. Obviously, these numbers are dramatically worse among the under 50,000. But I thought I'd just show you the overall numbers here, which are how would you describe your current level of savings? Now, we've heard a lot about savings. 30% are saying they've had to cut into their savings to pay bills right now. Another 28% saying, I've saved less money than usual over the last year. That combines for six in 10 people who are either saving less or cutting into their savings to pay bills. 28% are saying they've saved about the same, and 12% are saying they've saved more money. Next slide. Who do you trust more in the economy? 
this is a, an important question because now this poll, which originally was about issues that Sawyer cared about and Suffolk cared about, like diversity, equity, inclusion, like workplace uh, um, um, behaviors, um, working remotely and so on, has now shifted to a politics. And, and I think this is part of the reason why this survey got so much attention. There's a nine point, uh, an 11 point difference between people who trust Trump versus people who trust Biden. Next slide. So in this slide, you're looking at how less than people let making less than 50,000 answered that same previous question. Who do you trust more on the economy? Now, let me give you a little historical perspective. Keep this slide up just for an extra few seconds here. The people who say more than 100,000, it's expected that they will be voting for Trump. Those are people who have more wealth, they're more white, they own businesses, they are more conservative by nature. As a matter of fact, in the 2020 exit polling that happened on, on, on in, in, in November of that year, uh, Donald Trump won people earning more than 100,000 by 12 points. So this is really no, su no surprise, and Donald Trump lost the election, obviously. So this um, this amount is no surprise. He's up 14. He won by 12 in the 2020 election. But it's the less than 50,000s that matter here. And who are the people who are less that make less than $50,000? They're people who are just starting in their careers. They're young people. Maybe their first job isn't a $50,000, $60,000 job. Maybe it's an entry level position. Uh, or it's the very old you know, people who are in on fixed retirement, maybe their pensions aren't that big. And so these are two blocks of voters that 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 Joe Biden needs to have that are combined in this less than 50,000. But look at the poll result. This shouldn't be 46, 36 um, for uh, for Donald Trump. This should be the other way around. This should be 36, 46, because in that same exit polling in 2020, Joe Biden won this income group by 11 points. Think about that. You're looking at an 11 point win for Joe Biden among people less than 50,000, but not if the economy is this deciding issue. In this poll, it's showing that less than $50,000 uh, incomes are choosing Trump over Biden. And that is a, that's the, the most powerful finding from this survey, um, because it's not about race. It's not necessarily about partisan affiliation or even gender. This is the category, if you're Joe Biden, that you need to focus on in terms of turning around the November 2024 election. Next slide. This is what you would normally expect. This is the same question. Who do you trust more in economy uh, by education? And so what we see here is people who do, do not have a four-year degree overwhelmingly Trump by 20 points. People who have a four-year college degree or higher have uh, Biden as the person that they trust more on the economy by 46 to 38. That's the kind of disparity you would expect to see with income, but you do not see that. Next slide. So I wanted to just put that out uh, and, and sort of get get that information out. You're going to see a lot of discussion in the next month and in the next quarter as companies release their earning reports that include what people were saying in this Sawyer University uh, Sawyer Business School survey to, in September. You're going to pick that up in the data end of October, early November, or in December. And that's going to spill into the election in 2024. The second poll I want to uh, just kind of take you through quickly is the poll that we did with both USA Today and the Boston Globe. And by the way, NBC10 will be uh, uh, will be partnering with Suffolk University and the Boston Globe for tracking um, in New Hampshire, leading right up to the New Hampshire primary. But this is a statewide poll we did of just Republicans in New Hampshire. Next slide. So first question, 
who do you support in the Republican primary? You see Donald Trump at 49. This poll showed Nikki Haley at 19. Previous polls had showed Ron DeSantis second in New Hampshire. I believe these I believe these numbers are right. I think Haley is in second in New Hampshire. The reason that she's grown since six months ago, and I'm using other polls as a, lip, as a comparison here, because this was our first statewide poll in New Hampshire. The reason Haley has grown is because of the decline of Chris Christie and Tim Scott, who are highlighted here. Christie and Scott were both in the high single digits six months ago. They have dropped to Christie is now at 6%. Haley has benefited. Scott is now only at 4%. Haley has benefited. Relative to Don Ron DeSantis, that's a win-win for Haley. So as these other candidates drop, except for Vivek Ramaswamy, whose uh, second choice voters are rotating to Donald Trump, we can predict that as if Christie begins to drop even further or gets to two or one percent in New Hampshire, which I'm not predicting, but anything could happen, or if Tim Scott were to drop to two or one percent, Haley could potentially be in the low twenties in that test. Still far behind Donald Trump, but competitive. Next slide. So the question is, what happens if everybody drops out except for Trump and Nikki Haley? And what happens if everybody drops out in the in the case of Trump versus Ron DeSantis? And here you have the, the, the first bar is Trump, the second bar, uh, the pink bar is uh, Haley, and the third is undecided. And you can put in uh, my column, my, my uh, New Hampshire um, a poll column here as well. What I basically said in my column was, it's great for Nikki Haley to feel excited about finishing second. She's doing well in South Carolina. Those are both positives for her. But what this polling is telling us is that, that for Nikki Haley to grow, she needs the other candidates to drop out. For Ron DeSantis to grow, he needs Trump to lose support because Ron DeSantis' support on issues like wokeism and his pro-life position and a lot of his hardcore conservative positions, they're already being occupied in the space of Trump. So if Trump were to decline, it's DeSantis who would benefit first before Haley. If the other candidates decline, it's Haley who's going to benefit. So you've got Haley thriving in the space of the other candidates. As they decline, she improves, but not DeSantis. And if Trump declines, DeSantis benefits disproportionately three to one over Haley. So what you're seeing or what I'm seeing here in New Hampshire, and maybe the national media will pick this up in a month or so, but it may be too late by then, is that if this is indicative of the national polling, you really only have a three-way race in for, for the Republican primary. Trump, Haley, and DeSantis, or Trump, DeSantis, and, and, and Haley. But more importantly, what would have to happen to, 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 to make it competitive against Trump is that you'd need to have a Haley-DeSantis ticket announced right now, or a DeSantis-Haley ticket announced right now because what that would do is that ticket would attract second choice votes from all of the other candidates and it would attract voters who would rotate to the DeSantis part of the ticket if Trump were to decline. That to me is the best case scenario, but if the national media doesn't pick that up for another month or two, it'll be too late. We're, we're already you know weeks away from the first Iowa contest. Um, and several months away from New Hampshire. So that's really the, the plight for, uh, for DeSantis voters and for Haley voters. Next slide. Trump's trouble. So you, you might say, how the heck is Donald Trump so strong? So we asked the question, Donald Trump has been charged with an array of federal and state crimes. Which statement most closely matches your view? Donald Trump has done nothing wrong in the investigations that were politically motivated, 46%. Or Donald Trump has made questionable choices at times, but he did not do anything illegal, 27%. This is the reason why Trump hasn't debated. You might say, I can't believe the guy hasn't debated. Why would somebody do that? He's, he's missing out on important TV time. These poll results show that even with the troubles that he's had legally, and there are a lot, 
the Republican primary voters are sticking by him. Next slide. Important issues. You might also say, I can't understand why, at least up until the war just started a week ago, but I can't understand why people are only talking about border and jobs. And the reason is because it's a poll-driven decision. We gave voters a ton of issues to pick from in this question. Only two stood out. Seven in 10 voters say either it's economy, jobs, or more importantly, border immigration, at least in Republican primary space. Next slide. I also wanted to give you a few questions. If you think that Republican primary voters are crazy and extremist, there are three quick questions that show that, you know, these voters are similar to regular voters, um, you know, that include Democrats, Republicans, and independents. We asked the question, have you or someone you know ever been addicted to opioids? It comes out that about one in five households say they do. New Hampshire was no different. New Hampshire Republican primary voters was really no different here. So that was very similar. Next slide. Affordable housing. This is a very similar result as you would expect among the general voting population. How easy is it to find affordable housing in your community? Two thirds are saying not easy. That aligns with government statistics and other polling as well. So again, Republican primary vote is very similar to the general population. Next slide. Inflation impacts. It, these respondents who are Republican primary voters, they could have trashed the economy in this question. They could have said, it's, it's the worst I've ever seen. It's high, I can't pay my bills, but they were being honest. You look at the, uh, the, uh, the numbers that are highlighted here. 55% said, hey, inflation's high, but it's manageable. Not so bad. Or they were saying it's not impacting my household, or they were saying it's not as high as people say. Again, Republican primary voters being fairly reasonable on an issue that they could have exaggerated or could have said, you know, it's the worst I've ever seen, or I can't pay my bills. But then there are issues where the Republican primary voters deviate from the mainstream voters. Next slide. When you ask the question about the 14th Amendment, now, as you know, the 14th Amendment provides that if a person is born on U.S. soil, they are become they become a citizen of the U.S. That's been that's part of the, the 14th Amendment. It's called birthright citizenship. This question said, should the U.S. end birthright citizenship for children or unauthorized immigrants? Fifty eight percent are saying yes, they should. Next slide. On the question of how important is protecting abortion access to your vote? Now, I know from the 2022 midterm polling, abortion was important among independents, and this includes some independents and even some Republicans, but these Republican primary voters are saying the opposite. They're deviating from what normal voters are saying uh, in a national poll. 63% are saying abortion is not very or not at all important to their vote, only 4% said most important. And next slide, public schools. How concerned are you with how New Hampshire schools teach uh, uh, race and sexual identity? 50% said very, uh, and 21% somewhat. A high number, we're talking about New Hampshire, a neighboring state, even though they're Republican primary voters, putting uneven bias on teaching children in schools versus what you would see in a regular national poll. Next slide. Climate change. Again, this is a place where Democrats would do, uh, disagree um, enthusiastically and even independents. We asked the question, if nothing substantial, again, foot, underline those two words, if nothing substantial is done to reduce climate change, how serious of a problem will it be for New Hampshire? Look at the highlighted numbers. 26% of these voters saying it's a not very serious. Another 20% not at all serious. And another 15% of New Hampshire Republican primary voters, climate change is not happening. That's 61% of the vote. Next slide. And so this is what I call Trump's granite state grip. And you can see without going through each of these issues again, how Trump voters have a higher intensity on some of these issues, like the abortion question, which is 71% among Trump, Trump voters and 58% among all other voters. 
Same thing with concern about teaching race or identity. Same thing about the climate change question. Look at that. 77% of Trump voters uh, say that climate change isn't happening serious or not happening at all versus only 48%. So those are those are tell us that Trump voters are driving those extreme positions on those uh, issues. And on the right side, you see voter views, Trump voters again versus all of the other major candidates combined. Mind made up on the election. 84% of Trump voters have their mind made up. It's Trump, 33% of all others. Trump is innocent, charges are political, 76% versus 19% and whether Trump's nomination is inevitable. Next slide. The effect of Iowa and Sununu. So what this tells us is that neither the results of the Iowa caucuses or the results of Governor Sununu, who's very popular, his endorsement in this race is going to move people. We asked the question of all voters uh, whether uh, Sununu's endorsement will be uh, uh, could impact their vote, only 13% said it would, 86% said no. New Hampshire is New Hampshire, and they are not going to, to uh, uh, look at the Iowa results, as you can see on the right side. Uh, does the re Do the results of the Iowa caucus, will they impact your vote? Only 6% Republican primary voters said yes, 90% say no. And final slide, I believe, uh, no. Second to last slide. So who's in play in New Hampshire? Forget Democrats. Democrats don't have a bar on this chart because they cannot vote in the Republican primary. They had up until a couple of weeks ago to change their voter registration from Democrat to independent. They uh, cannot vote in the Republican primary. So you have 275,000 roughly uh, eligible Republicans about 344,000 eligible independents. And the big unknown, those people who are what we call voter eligible population, 141,000 plus people who are adults, citizens in New Hampshire who are not registered to vote, who could vote in New Hampshire because the rule of thumb is that they can register the day of the election and then cast a ballot. This is why New Hampshire is so exciting. This is why oftentimes there's a lot of volatility, because if independents play a bigger role, margins or candidates can rise and fall. And you also have the ability of people not registered to suddenly engage and get into the process. And my final slide is the next slide. I thought I would uh, add to s some of, some of the uh, uh, sobering results that I presented to you, kind of an entertaining question, which is, and again, this is Republican primary voters, which of the following descriptors most closely reflects how you feel about Massachusetts? I thought that uh, it is home to my favorite sports teams would dominate this question, but this is why we ask questions because you don't know what you're going to get. Most people said too many of its residents, us, are moving to New Hampshire, 32%. Uh, second was it is a high tax, high cost state, 28%. And 12% said, I have no feelings about Massachusetts. And on that note, I will close. And uh, thank you for your attention and time and uh, happy to chat further. Well, David, that was awesome. It was almost too much to digest. Such a well done presentation with two very important pieces of research. And so let's dig into it in the time that we have left right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Latoya Edwards from NBC10 Boston. And I love talking this stuff with you. We're, again, accepting your questions. Put them in the chat. We'll get to them in just a moment. I just have a couple of quick questions. Uh, David, as you look at how New Hampshire residents and voters, Republican voters, have answered these questions and how they pair up with uh, general uh, questions and responses. Let's talk deeper about issues that mean the most to them. I was certainly surprised. And let's, when you talked about the economy being a huge topic, especially inflation for all folks right now, but in New Hampshire, in your research, you're finding that, again, border and immigration is the highest issue of importance in New Hampshire. You would think maybe if we were closer to, let's say, Texas or Arizona border states, we're next to Canada. Is that really the worry? And why do you think that is? 
I think the the broadcast uh, that you've seen in conservative television uh, of suburbia uh, being invaded, quotes, their quotes, their word, by uh, um, illegals is resonating through states that you would not expect. I was surprised as well. As a matter of fact, that number was higher than the economy. And it's almost like a self-fulfilling fulfilling prophecy. These candidates do polling. The polling comes back, shows kind of what we, we're showing. It's only about economy and border. And that's all they talk about. So then they get their own basis whipped up on the economy and immigration. And then we then poll them again. And you've got this self-perpetuating reality that border security is the most important thing. And, and when conservative TV begins to link it to other issues like domestic crime and other issues, then it becomes more of a more of more of a, a a border state issue. Yeah. And when I think about David, the the conversation around New Hampshire in general and its importance, whether given its racial and uh diversity makeup, there's always a question about its importance, its lineup in of the voting schedule for the country. Do you think that that debate, that conversation, especially with Democrats pushing for it to drop a little bit in its importance, do you think that is playing a role in these election or these results for you for respondents? Yes and no. I didn't for Barack Obama, you know, who started in 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 um, uh, uh, Iowa really well. But remember, Barack Obama lost New Hampshire. To your point. He lost to New Hampshire to to, uh, to Hillary Clinton in 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 2008. It was a huge upset, and I remember that because we were polling we were polling, and we had two bellwether, two small communities showing Hillary Clinton winning. All of the polling had Obama winning New Hampshire, and I was I was squeamish releasing those bellwether results because it was so counter to what was going on. Part of that was race. But also part of it was that Hillary Clinton was able to do what I kind of talked about in that second to last slide, which she found women, especially who were not registered to vote in New Hampshire, who liked her, to get out and vote for her, never got picked up in the polls because polls screen out people who aren't registered to vote. And so she kind of flew under the radar and that's how she pulled the upset there. I think to your to your first question, yeah, I mean, I think it, it depends on what the priorities are. And I think for Biden and the Democrats, they've sent a clear message. New Hampshire should not be counted for us. South Carolina should be counted because it's more diverse. And I think that sta that speaks to the values of the parties, uh, whereas the Republicans were fine having Iowa and New Hampshire being the top two, even though they have persons of color as potential nominees. And Davey, as always, you continue to create headlines and you grab people <laughs> with your solid research. So that Donald Trump, 49% among New Hampshire uh, voters, uh, Nikki Haley, 19%, Ron DeSantis, 10%. But on the national scale, Ron DeSantis has a narrative that he is solidly in second place. At least that is the, the feeling out there, whether the numbers line up. So you've totally blown folks away. What is it about his approach, is it Nikki Haley's message? Is it about the independence? And they're always uh, sort of upsetting the apple cart. What is going on here with these numbers? So part of it is message, but part of it is visits. If you look at Ron DeSantis's visits over the last three months, he wasn't in New Hampshire for most of that time. I mean, he just filed paperwork. And all of that time, Nikki Haley has been at the community events. Her people have been door knocking. They have been getting her message out. And so she has become more of an alternative to Donald Trump. Plus, I think New Hampshire uh, uh, marches to a different drummer. They don't like to pick the person second or first that Iowa picks. Uh, in this case, you know, even Donald Trump is polling lower in New Hampshire than he is in Iowa. But I think this was a major shift in the political landscape. But I think it was Ron DeSantis' own doing. He wasn't visible. And in New Hampshire, you you can't win an air war. In New Hampshire, you have to look eye to eye into, into community events, and you have to sell yourself at the local level. Haley has done that, at least up, up until now, um, and DeSantis has not.
So the grassroots uh, politicking it makes a difference. And we know that we've seen it year after year after year. But let's talk about Donald Trump and how you went directly to the potential legal woes. And Donald Trump supporters are sticking with him. And you, you showed those slides. But do you think that conversation will change with those strong supporters when if he is convicted of something? I know that the, you, you had research that talked about we don't think he did anything wrong or he may have uh, moved the needle a little bit, but not enough where it's a problem. If he actually is convicted in the courtroom, would that change it? So that's a terrific question. And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and I, I think he he probably will lose some people. Um, but remember, New Hampshire is probably of the early states the most progressive because people who are independents or what they call undeclareds in New Hampshire, they can vote. In Iowa, you cannot caucus unless you're a registered Republican. That's the rule. No independents in Iowa, which is why Trump is even higher there. Uh, and in Florida, same same thing. You have to be Republican. There are many states where independents are uh, put aside. So in that small subset where th Trump thrives, I think maybe he loses some people. I, I you know, I can't believe that he'd have a hundred percent efficiency uh, there. But he certainly would lose ground in a state like New Hampshire if he were if that were to happen between now and the New Hampshire primary, because well, independence independence would step up vote with increasing intensity and probably support whoever was second. And in this case, that would be Haley. David, I have to ask you, um, you're about your economic research, which was mind blowing. I mean, when we hear about folks saying horrible, awful, bad shambles to describe the U.S. economy, we certainly understand that sentiment. But how does that match up with the White House message and the data that they have released. I mean, you said that some of the um, financial channels have been toting the government line, but the numbers do show that there is a strong job market, a robust job market right now, not the greatest, but a robust job market. And then for so many uh, months, we've seen uh, a 9% uh, drop in June of 2022 to 3.7% uh, last month regarding um, inflation. I mean, it has ticked up a bit, but June, it was at a record number, a, a record low. So how do these narratives match? And do you think the White House will pivot their message to sort of match up with the pain and the hurt that um, regular folks are feeling right now with inflation? Bill Clinton used to say, I feel your pain all the time. And, and the, you know, maybe, maybe taking a page out of that book would be, would be wise. I think the answer to your question is this, there can be a dialectic, which is, there can be high inflation and high interest rates. There can be positive unemployment statistics, and there can be high anxiety on the economy. There can be both. But what I would say is think about it in terms of chronology. What you're looking at is government statistics based on a month or two ago or a quarter ago. What we uncovered is the, the, the granular anxiety people are feeling today, right now, and that they're saying they're going to spend less over the holiday season. That's very powerful because what it tells me is what we released in September is going to be picked up in the government statistics in a month or two or in the next quarter. And that's why it's so significant in terms of impacting the 2024 election. Biden needs to focus on the under 50,000 household subset he won that subset comfortably in 2020, and he's losing it you know, pr pretty badly right now. Do you think it's just an issue of being an incumbent and dealing with the real world problems, whether it's Trump dealing with uh, COVID and the pandemic and now Biden dealing with inflation, that if you're in the hot seat, which is the presidency, you're, of course, going to have to accept the responsibility of the economic factors that are out there right now? Yeah, so you, all, you have that buck stops here mentality where people will... It, a person who's in that under 50,000, their quality of life is bad. I mean, I I heard their voices. They're not doing well. And they and, and, and so they they're going to view whoever's in charge, in this case, President Biden, with this person, the quality of my life has declined. You know, even if they're not cutting into their savings, 
they're still cutting their spending and nobody feels good about having to have less in your food basket at the grocery store or postponing a, a haircut or 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 you know delaying a, a home improvement or not traveling when that quality of life decline s spills into a person that's cutting seven out of seven spending categories it does have implications politically absolutely and then especially when you think about the fact that yeah the jobs are robust but People are not making more, and they're usually getting one or two jobs just to make their old salary. All right, it is time to listen to the people who are watching right now, the people who are participating in this. We want to hear directly from you. Get your questions to David and this unbelievable research. Okay, I'm going to get to my laptop here right now and just start ticking away the questions. Uh, here's a question right now. Do you think the lack of a House speaker for two weeks plus will impact independent New Hampshire primary voters? Ah. Fewer. Great question. Um, I, I do. I do. Um, it's an ugly scenario. And this question kind of tees up something I probably shouldn't say to everybody, but I will, is that we are releasing a new national poll next week. And we asked the question about the speaker's fight. We asked the question about views towards Congress. And we separated it, members of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and I urge you to check out, there are going to be three national stories next week. I think it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Don't hold me to that. But I think those stories are going to pop next week, a national survey. And it's going to impact um, how voters feel about Speaker, Congress, and even among Republicans. We broke some news, David. I was going to oh, ask yeah. you, when can we get more? Thank you oh, for yeah. that. Okay, well, let's look at another question from our participants right now. Uh, and they're looking at this. Do you do your bellwether polling sample show that anything can change the Trump lead in New Hampshire across and across the country? Not currently. But again, I, and my poll students who are watching know this. Polls are a snapshot in time. Events do drive um, public opinion. You know, um, the, these polls that were cited happened before the, the war, you know, a week ago. And that's why I'm glad that, you know, we, we're, we have new fresh numbers coming out next week because we do ask questions about the Israeli Hamas war. And we ask questions about Russia and Ukraine and and uh, and even Taiwan. So you'll you'll be able to get some fresh numbers on that. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully they'll th th that will shine a little bit of light. Um, you know, I never like to cut and paste and take what I see today and say this means that November, this is going to happen. The only way you can do that is to freeze every other variable statistically, and we know that that's impossible to do. Variables, the, the, the things, as, as you know, Latoya, I mean, things change, you know, hour to hour in this business. So, you know, uh, if, look, if the economy goes away as an issue, Biden has an excellent chance of being reelected. The economy rebounds, if if it, if people are less concerned about immigration and the wars settle out, there's really no reason to take a flyer with whoever the Republican nominee is. Looks like Trump at this point. But if the economy continues to unravel, and that's what I think we were starting to pick up in that that first poll I cited, which kind of flies in the face of what the economists have been saying, then he he has time. Biden does, but he needs to begin to prepare now using his own research to try and figure out how to fix that problem. David, here's another question from our audience right now. It says, what is the attraction to Trump? And I believe it must be for those who earn under 50K. Trump has touted that he's a billionaire. How do they connect with him? And what is the attraction? Or is it just because he is not Biden? Okay, so for the under 50K group, I, I would divide it into two subsets. There are people who normally, right, we know from the exit polling, they would normally vote for Biden over Trump. There are people whose personal plight is so bad that they're not voting for Biden, pure and simple. And then there are people who might be in that income category who are less educated. And we saw that the less educated numbers were 20 points to Trump. And doesn't that's not that's you know that, that's just a statistic. People who either weren't able to advance beyond a high school diploma, 
or only have some college or have trade or t- a technical training. Um, those are people who would be more predisposed to Trump, pro-Trump versus the first subset, which would be more anti-Biden. Because there are a lot of people who are disabled in that under 50,000 household. There are a lot of people who are disabled not making in you know in their current state over fifty thousand dollars, and they're they're tending to their own personal needs to survive and to deal with their situation. But if at every turn they're paying more, then it's going to impact their their selection for president too. So, David, here's a question from our audience right now, and it says directly: What about the reduction by trillions in debt since Biden took office? That again is from our audience. Okay, that's a great question. And the the way to make that stick is to make the connection through messaging because the messaging that people have isn't coming from a political candidate or a political action committee. The message is at Shaw's or at Market Basket or at, you know, Wild Oats or wherever you're food shopping. That's the message that they're getting. So that that that's a good message and that's a prudent message, but it's not hitting people not only in you know where, where their wallet is, but where their heart is. And so oftentimes we in Latoya, you know this better than anybody, when it comes to a social issue versus the economy or you know a, 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 a some other one-off issue versus the economy, Oftentimes, if the economy is unraveling, perception-wise, I'm not saying it's 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 true. Unemployment is at its lowest rate, but what's happening is people have to work an extra job to pay their grocery bill or to put in extra hours and reduce the quality of their life to pay for or postpone other expenses. And that's, I think, what what Biden and the Democrats have to get their arms around. Well, I'm here. Here's another question: How much of the projected decrease in dining out and clothing purchases are a hangover from pandemic habits versus inflation right now? So the only way to figure that out would be to 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 ask the question about pandemic and then do a cross tab. Very difficult to say. I mean, we can speculate what that what that cutback would be, um, but I think when you look at the pattern, the thread of seven out of seven categories, especially among that under 50, you know, that's that's too, it almost buttons up too clean. And it's, it's a demographic that, you know, obviously Trump wants to, you know, keep it the way it is, you know, um, uh, and he'll probably remind people of what the inflation rate was when he was president. He's already doing that. Um, compared to compared to Joe Biden. So again, a, the trick of, with a lot of this, there is good news with Joe Biden and the Democrats, but it's not messaging correctly. And I don't know if that's the candidate, the candidate's committee, or just the 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 general uh, sort of consumption of the information. And so I, it, this is actually a question to you from uh, m- the young people who produce our newscast here at NBC10 Boston. Uh, these are young. Answering. What'd you say? <laughs> You have to. <laughs> and uh, they're they're young, they're smart, and they're excited to vote in this election. And I asked them, and they want to know about the issue of age. And I don't know if this came up with your research as well. Both of our candidates are of a certain age, a close in age, but for some reason, why is Biden uh, being labeled as older, slower? Is it a messaging thing that Trump has sort of put on Biden? Um, why did voters seem not to um, see an age issue for Trump? Well, we're going to find that out next week. Um, as a matter of fact, um, uh, my delightful, wonderful executive assistant, Mary Power Air, had suggested a question about age and whether or not voters believe age 65 should be the max for Congress, Senate, and the Supreme Court, or age 75, or age 85, or no age. We're going to be releasing that those results as well. Um, to to your to to the first part of your your question, the young voters should be a natural pool for Biden and the Democrats to draw from, but it's a little bit complicated. You have now RFK is now running for president, and 
he's a little bit hipper um and he 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 is he appeals to that uh that person that's not the biden trump matchup that nobody wants and he has some bona fides but he's going to potentially choke off some voters who are biden voters but also who are trump voters and we're also going to have numbers on that as well next week oh you were giving us lots of teases i can't wait to read into your next level of research here. So here's another question from our audience right now. It says, how much facts matter over feelings? Inflation is trackable, but there's no economic crisis. What's your take on that? Yeah, so the the answer to the question is, how do people vote? Is it a an intellectual ec- exercise only? Do people vote if they have a gut feeling? And why are commercials, why are political ads designed to appeal to your emotion? And that is because we are human beings. We have feelings and we we intertwine those feelings with facts. I mean, who would have thought that Ray Flynn would have been elected mayor of Boston as, as a pro-life guy? Boston voters, although you know this better than anybody, Latoya, is overwhelmingly pro-choice. Intellectually, people should have, just on that one issue alone, should have said, Ray Flynn, no, he's pro-life. He was a mayor for a long time. So there are more things that go into it than just facts, even though facts in my world are the most important thing, and I have to keep emotion out. But Voters don't view it that way. Voters have feelings. And if they feel like their quality of life has declined or that they're not as safe as they were, that's going to impact who they vote for, despite the fact. Well, and I'm getting back to your economic research here. I was looking at this. When 70% of respondents feel the economy is getting worse, of course, that's the headline. But who exactly are the 22%, the other people who feel like it's improving? Uh, what's their income, their housing? Are they Democrats? Are they just Joe Biden um, supporters? What, break that down for us. I wouldn't say just Joe Biden supporters, but they, but but a lot of them are supportive of of where we are um, and and where what Joe Biden has done. And the, to, to, to the... Uh, the messaging of previous questions, a lot has been done, but people aren't feeling it. And I guess what I'm saying is better to have this research today than next October, if you're a Biden or if you're a Democrat, if this is the research you have next October, it's going to be a scramble to turn things around. He, Biden, has a, the, an opportunity to, 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 to solve that messaging problem uh, and to address the issues that he needs to address. And that 22% was disproportional uh, women, um, Biden voters uh, and or uh, Democratic voters um, as well, and some older people, because um, there are some older people who will retire well and do do well financially. And, you know, the the, the makings of the economy, whether it's up or down or in between, really don't impact their standing. When I looked at the list of things that matter to the voters that you got to regarding the economy, uh, child care is at 1% for most rising cost right now, yet Biden and Democratic leadership has been touting lots of assistance for child care on a federal and a national level. Is it a tone deaf issue? I don't think so. I think it's more surgical. I think what he's going after are the people, the, the suburban, the suburban moms, but to your point, the in the grand scheme of things, not everyone has children or is lucky enough to to have children, and um, and and some don't need childcare. There might be uh, a working parent, or they have relatives or grandparents who can care for the their children. So it is kind of a niche issue. But from his own polling, probably he figures that he needs to do better among that that specific demographic, and that's probably a box that he wants to check you know, before before January 2024, when the campaign starts. David, I couldn't have timed it better. Thank you so much for your research. Thank you uh, for everybody watching and sending us those wonderful questions. Susan, we'll turn it back over to you. 
Thank you, LaToya. And thank you so much for your uh, extraordinary moderation. Uh, much, much appreciated. Uh, David, as always, thank you so, so much for this enlightening conversation. Uh, we will be looking forward to next week. We will be looking forward to your extraordinary polling that will be taking place over the course of the upcoming year. It will be a very, very busy time for you and your colleagues at the Political Research um, uh, Center at Suffolk University. I want to lift up Mary Power Air, our colleagues at GBH Forum Network, um, the Office of Advancement, and our Political Science and Legal Studies Department. We had a really, really robust Zoom uh, audience, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. And I want to do a real big shout out to a large, large gathering at Suffolk University. We had a viewing party still going on. We had students and alumni and parents and faculty and staff. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us. I, we could feel your enthusiasm uh, through this, 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 Zoom, um, this Zoom call. So thank you so much and have a good afternoon.